this week has been a doozy for me. A lot of suffering, yet a lot of blessing. Hence the life of a someone who follows Christ. And in doing so, I've been reading this book. It's The Prisoner in the Third Cell by Gene Edwards. And tucked back in the back of the book is this question. Shall we scorn that God has revealed so little concerning his ways or rejoice that he has revealed so much? It's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Because so many times we go through something and we don't have the answers and therefore we think that he is being, well, he's being aloof. And sometimes that brings us to a place where we become disenchanted. But the truth is that God shows us so much about himself in the word that if you're always reading and studying, you know more about God than, than maybe you think. And I've been reading through the book of Ephesians. Hats off to a ministry leader that, that pointed something out in a Bible study that I never noticed before. And I want to talk about that. Because the book of Ephesians is a letter from Paul to the church in Ephesus, and it is a victorious letter. So much positive, so much blessing, so much Chapters 1, 2, and 3 tell us that God has given us blessing after blessing after blessing. Chapter 4 says, therefore, let's be this way. We need to live a life that is honoring to God, not because we have to, but because we want to, based on everything that he's done for us. He tells us so much about his personality in this letter, and that personality should then come and wash over us and bring us to a place where we know who we need to be in this present day. <clears throat> so I want to, in this Bible study, take you through chapters 1 through 4 in Ephesians and then show you a picture of what I'm talking about, putting on the new man and taking off the old man. I want to show you an, uh, a, a case study in the Gospels and then tell you, uh, maybe give you a warning. So in Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to start in verse 3, Reading in the New Living Translation, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. He's given us every spiritual blessing in the spiritual realm because we're united with Christ. If you've been born again, you've accepted Jesus to be your Savior, that the Spirit indwells in you. If this is a part of your life, you have been endowed with the spiritual blessing, every single spiritual blessing that the heavenly realm has to offer you. <clears throat> Verse 4, even before he made the world, God loved us, loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. He's speaking of the redemption through Jesus' blood that brings us back to him. Remember, in, the, in Genesis, they were together. We had communion with God. But once, once Adam and Eve sinned, there was a chasm between God and man. Jesus Christ filled the chasm by paying off our sins and brings us closer to God, brings us back to him. That's what that sentence says. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Sometimes we wonder, why would God allow people to go and sin? Why would God give away his son? Why would his son willingly do all this? Because it's the joy set before him that brought him to a place. That it's us. He loves us. He cares for us. We made decisions that don't seem normal for us, but great sacrifice has been made so that we could be with him. That's how much he loves us. Verse 6, we, so, uh, this is what he wanted to do, gave him great pleasure. So, verse 6, we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all the wisdom and understanding. You see blessings everywhere. Just in the first paragraph of the first chapter, Paul has already told us all the things that we own because we believe in Jesus Christ, why we are in his family, 
that it, that it brought him to a place of great joy to do this for us and the things that he gives us because of that blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Verse nine, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan at the right time. He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God had a plan. God says, in due season, Jesus will come back to earth. He will have authority over all things, seen and unseen, because he is the creator of it. And he has brought us to a place where we have an inheritance in that plan. If, of course, you believe in Jesus, you've accepted him as your Christ. How amazing is that? The creator of the world wants us to be in the plan. He wants us to be in the plan. I, I can't take it any further than that. It's the most important and most amazing promise in the Bible. That he loved us so much that he made us and entered us and got us into the plan. Verse 12. <clears throat> God's purpose was... That we Jews, remember Paul is a Jew talking to those in Ephesus. Ephesus is in Turkey. They are Gentiles. He says God's purpose that we the Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth. The good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he had purchased us for his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Hmm. Verse 15, ever since I've heard of your strong faith in the Lord, Jesus, and your love for God's people everywhere, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Did you know that the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit of God, rests in us, those who have accepted Jesus, because the Spirit rests in us too. There is a day when we die, whether through the resurrection, through the, through the rapture of the church, or our death, that we too will be resurrected to life, just like Jesus. That power rests in me. It rests in you. Verse 20, that raised, <clears throat> verse, uh, tw verse 19, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. And now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. At the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. See the church as a body. Jesus is the head. The church, the collective church of believers who truly believe in Jesus Christ and him crucified and him resurrected and him ascending into heaven, him who died for us, who's given us the opportunity to be spiritually reborn. If you believe in that, you're part of the church and the church is the body of Christ. You see this, see this kind of cohesion between Jesus and the church. We want to see the fact that he has put all of this in our midst because God has given all authority to Jesus when he comes back to rule and reign a thousand years here on earth. We're going to be a part of that gig because we're part of the body of Christ. So into chapter 2, verse 1, once you were dead because of your disobedience. And now, now 
you've got to remember that the issue of sin is the issue of death. <clears throat> Spiritual death and separation from God comes because we are sinners. And a just and holy God, a righteous God, cannot commune with someone who is not righteous and holy. The point here is, is that if you had sinned even once, and there is a myriad of sins, of course, we've all we've all done. We were born into sin. We don't, we, we, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners and we need to rectify the problem of being a sinner. So, so we need to pay for the debt that was created by our sin. Jesus did that for us on the cross. And if you accept him, then you're, it's paid off and then you're found to be righteous and you can come and close that gap between you and God. That's the whole point of the good news. So he's telling Gentiles here who never knew, who never knew Judaism, didn't know the law, didn't follow the law, could not have followed the law, although they have in their being innately what's wrong and right because God has made us in his image. Paul is saying you were once dead in your sins because of your disobedience to God. Quite frankly, you didn't know, but I'm telling you now that you know. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subjects to God's anger, just like everyone else. <clears throat> but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. <clears throat> it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus, the body of Christ. So, verse 7 God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Now let's talk about grace for a minute. Grace is unearned, unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, but God gives it anyway. What that is called is grace. God saved you because you don't deserve it, but because he gives it freely. And how did he give it? Through his son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself so that you would be made whole. So God saved you by his grace, his unmerited favor. So when you believed in him, when you believed in Jesus, and you can't take credit for any of this, it's not a work you can take credit for. God gave it as a gift. It is a gift from God. Verse 9, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. This is crucial to understand. Because everybody who says, I'm a good person, and because I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven, has it wrong. Everyone is sinned, and everyone is in debt to God. So you need to get that debt rectified. You cannot go and do a thousand good works and turn around and say, I earned myself into heaven by being a good person. It doesn't work that way. God gave his son to take care of your sins. It is given by grace as a gift. You cannot earn it. So the only way, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way is to accept Jesus as your Savior and turn over your sinful life to him. He will be made, you will be made righteous and holy in the eyes of God by being washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he had to shed blood at Calvary. Jesus, God has made us a masterpiece, a poema. 
He's made us so that we would love him and 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 do the things for good people, to go out and do good things. He's got them lined up for you. As long as you walk in Christ, he'll line good things up for you to do so that you can be worthy of the gift that he's given you. But realize this isn't all a have to. This needs to be a want to, a reverence of love and grace back to God because of all of these many things he's done for you. The blessings he pours out to you, the love and wisdom and courage and grace and unmerited favor, mercy, things you deserve you're not getting. It's not coming to you as you deserve them. Why? Because God chose to bless you this way. We need to get our eyes fixed on what the truth is, that God pours his blessings over and over and over and over again to all the way to the point where he sacrificed his son so that we would be made whole. That's the greatest gift that any man could ever receive. It's one you cannot earn. You just have to accept it. This this hurts people because people want to go out and do things to feel like they're doing good so that they can feel good about themselves. But He's looking for someone with a broken, contrite heart, someone who is humble and says, Lord, I am a sinner and I admit I'm a sinner and I need you every minute of every day. I give you my sins and I give you my life and I take up this cross and I want to follow you and it will be given to you by faith, eternal life, wisdom, love, glory, all of that thing will be given to you in the next life. How wonderful that is. Well, Ephesians chapter two, verse Uh, 11 continues, and it says, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. The point is there. Back in Abraham, God came to Abraham and said, I want you as the Jewish nation to circumcise your boys at day eight. I need them circumcised. That circumcision should be a sign that you have given me your heart. Now, of course, as we read through the Old Testament, we find out that circumcision was done as a work to feel religious and feel good about themselves, but they never changed their heart. They never changed the way that they acted. God wanted a physical circumcision to be a sign of a spiritual circumcision, the slicing and cutting away of your sinful nature. But They failed this ridiculously. So that's what Peter is, that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying these Jews have been called you uncircumcised heathens as if they're not them. They just happen to be that they're circumcised and not living this life correctly. He's doing a good job of saying you were seen by outsiders as Jews. But what's going to happen is, is when, when Christ came, you guys were brought together as a third people, Christians. And these are different than Jews or Gentiles. Christians are those who believe in Jesus and are saved. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made for them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For him, uh, verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when he in his own body on the cross broke down the wall of hostility that separates us. Now, instead of Jews being angry at Gentiles and Gentiles being angry at Jews, if you accepted Christ, it's brought together and you have this new brotherhood and they don't hate each other because they're all in Christ. And that's something that I have seen because taking trips to Brazil where I can't even speak the language, we as Christians in America and Christians in Brazil came together in a brotherhood. I can't explain it except that I know that it is through the blood of Christ that brings us into familyhood together. We didn't have any disagreements because we love each other as Christ loved the church. 
<clears throat> verse six to, uh, 15, he did this by ending the system of law with his commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Now it's not Jews and Gentiles, now it's Christians. The third group. <clears throat> Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. By the way, I need to make a point here. The Gentiles of the time were far away from God. They didn't know God. The Jews knew God but didn't care. And they were, so both were far away from God, even though one knew about God and one didn't. God's, God's whole point of the Jews was to call himself a, a perfect per, a people and bring those people together and give them God's laws and so that they could share it with the Gentiles. But Jews thought themselves self-righteous and didn't want to pay and didn't want to give it over. So Paul was given the charge to take the gospel to the Gentiles to bring us into communion together. God always had a heart to save everyone who wanted to come to him. And the Bible tells us that at the time of the end, everyone will have heard the name of Jesus and everyone who will accept him will be saved. And then it'll move into the tribulation period. Verse 18, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. We have been joined together, like-minded, single-hearted, driven towards our eyes in Christ. <clears throat> So now, verse 19, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with all the God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We are carefully joined together in him because of the holy temple of the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of his dwelling where God lives by his spirit. What he's saying is, is the, the body of Christ grows as it is in a building. The chief cornerstone, the stone that was used to, to build the entire thing. If you had a blueprint, you laid the first stone and everything was measured off that stone. That stone is Jesus Christ. Everyone else put on top of year after year, century after century, thousand years after millennial after millennium who believed in Jesus Christ are built inside this body of Christ. That's what he's talking about here. And as we move into chapter 3, it says, When I think of all of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. He's like, he's like hey, I want you to know that God gave me grace to teach this to you. He is the one who's asked me to do this. This is why I'm doing it. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. And as you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to pr previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. We can see this stated another way, Paul says in Acts chapter 16, when he says, he says that, that God kind of put up with the sins up until now because Jesus died and now it's time to repent of your sins because it's time that you know the mystery of who Christ was, why the Messiah was important so that you could be saved. That's what he's saying here. You guys had put up with it. God had put up with it up until this point, but now... It's time to come clean and time to come to Jesus and repent of your sins. Verse 6, and this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. This is important because a lot of people, some people believe that the Jews are God's chosen people and they'll have more inheritance than the Gentiles, which is untrue. It says it here that they will equally be there if they believe in Jesus Christ. Some believe that in replacement theology that says that God is done with the Jews and it's only the church now, which is wrong. It says here, both Gentiles and Jews who believe in Christ will be equally inherit, will inherit equally the riches that, uh, by being God's children. The only point is there's the saved and there's the lost. The saved is made up of anyone who believes in Jesus, no matter where you come from, whether you're a Gentile or a Jew. You believe in Christ, you're in the body of Christ, and you have been saved. You are equal co-heirs of the inheritance given forth by Jesus Christ in the heavenlies.
Both are part of the same body <clears throat> and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Jesus Christ. Verse 7, by God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, has kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in his rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was the eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's, into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you, so you should feel honored. He says, look, because Christ died, because the, the veil was torn in two in the temple, because Christ was, was taken up into heaven, and now he stands to the right side of God, he intercedes for us, he is the, holy, he is the high and holy priest that is in heaven, we can come personally to the to the throne room of God and intercede and pray to him in our time of need. I don't need a priest. I don't need somebody in the church. I can pray to him directly because of what Jesus has done for us, for me. He listens to what I feel. He listens to what I say. He knows how I feel because he was a man and he put up with it for 33 years and died a gruesome death. He knows how I feel in the sufferings that I've had this week. He knows how I feel in the mercy and grace and blessing that I've had this week. And he comes, he, I can come to him personally through prayer. That's just talking to God. Remember, I said in another video that Christianity isn't a religious thing. It's more like sitting down across the table from a good friend and pouring out your heart to someone who really cares. Because he does. He wants to hear from you. He wants to bless you. He wants to shape you and mold you and refine you into who he thinks you should be. He has a plan. He's had that plan from the beginning. To so realize you can walk into the throne room of grace and ask what you need. God will give you what you need. Maybe it's not what you want. I've asked for healing in my left ear because it doesn't work. And I haven't got it as of yet, but I know that he is gracious and good. And I know that whatever is happening here is going to turn out for my glory and my goodness and my refinement. And if somehow he miraculously heals it, which he can, then amen and praise the Lord for that. But if he doesn't, how good will that praise music sound with two perfect ears when I'm standing in heaven? Either way, I will be healed. Paul was given the charge of teaching this good news to the Gentiles, and he takes it seriously. And he tells them, hey, don't worry about the trials I'm dealing with. Don't worry about my jail cell I'm living in. Don't worry about that because what I'm doing is a sacrifice for you. Praise the Lord. Verse 14, when I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is for you. Many May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, and then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. This is the point here he's making. You may not understand all of that stuff, but you can understand his love and grace, his love and the power and everything that can be given unto you for giving your life over to him. Remember the quote we had, then the quote paraphrased, is it bad because should we be mad at God for not telling us what he's doing or should we be should we be happy that God has told us so much about himself Paul is saying don't worry about the stuff you don't understand cling to the stuff that you do because what I'm telling you about is goodness and grace his love for you his mercy 
what he's done through his son, his sacrifice to bring you back in, all of these blessings, chapters one through three, all of the blessings of who he is and what he does and all these things. Take that into consideration because you know more about him than you think. And let the stuff you don't understand go until now. There will be a day when you stand before him that he knows you and you'll know him and you'll have a complete understanding of why all of this has happened in the first place. So what I want to go into is chapter four, and this is where he switches over. He says, God has blessed you with all of this stuff. And therefore, who do we need to be? Who should we be in return? Not because we have to be, because we want to be, because we're so thankful for the blessings that we want to walk in a way that reverent, that's reverential, that's, that, that loves and shows love to others and to God himself, to love Christ with all our heart, soul, minds, and strength, and to love people, our neighbor, love our neighbors and our enemies as ourself. See, so we, we can't earn it by what we do, but we sure as heck can thank God by living a life that justifies what he's done for us. So chapter four, verse one says, therefore, <clears throat> we always wondered what's the therefore, therefore, so it's there because God has given us all of these blessings. Therefore, here's how we should be. Here's how we should act. A prisoner. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other and each other's faults because of your love for them. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, one faith, that's Christianity, one baptism, that's, that's immersive baptism in water, in the midst of understanding what it means. Not sprinkling of babies, not any of that stuff. One baptism. That is the baptism of immersion in water when you understand what it means, that you're being buried with Christ and raised a new man. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, the Father of the God of the Bible, who is over all and in all and living through all. That doesn't, Allah is not the same God as the God of the Bible. There are completely different entities. One exists, one does not. Verse 7, however, he has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scripture says when he ascended to the heights, he led crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Psalm 68, 18. Verse 9, notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who assembled, who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. There is points. There are people that believe that Jesus did not come in the flesh. But if he ascended to heaven, he would have had to descend to the earth to ascend to heaven. So Jesus came as God in the flesh. We need to see the little details here. They're important to know. Verse 11, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all call to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. I believe that God has called me to teach you the word of God. And that's why I do this. This is a calling for me. The gift, the, cry, the spirit has given to me is the spirit of teaching, the gift of teaching. And that's why I do what I do. I want you to know this because as we come, I love this. This is so cool. This will continue teaching and teaching and teaching, building up, edifying the church. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, 
measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. It is our job to teach you so that people get closer and closer and closer and closer to the understanding, a complete understanding in the body of Christ of who Jesus and who God is, what he has revealed to us about himself in his word. Verse 14, and then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps in the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Jesus is using all these people with all these different gifts to bring every in a cohesive like a body, like different parts of the body. He says in another letter, he says, maybe you're an eye or maybe you're a mouth or maybe you're an ear or maybe you're an internal organ. You're somebody that nobody sees, but you're really important in how the church operates. All of these people come together with gifts to lead the church forward, to bring us to a place where we can be cohesive and single-minded in Christ. That we can work as an organization that is led by God, led by Jesus, the head. It's such a cool picture because it's so true and it's so, it's so descriptive of what we should be. And that's our heart to get this information to you so you would be, you would choose to come into the body of Christ and take your true place, the place God has known since the beginning of time that you should have in his body. Verse 17, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Those who don't know Christ are foolish. Those who do know Christ are wise. That says that in a number of places in the book of Proverbs. Solomon, the wisest man on the planet ever to live, says the beginning of wisdom the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. And if you choose not to seek after God and his wisdom, you will be found foolish. So that's the part as he's going into this. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they close their minds and harden their hearts against him. These are people who deny God exists. Anybody who wants to follow anything other than Jesus Christ, anybody who wants to follow anything other than the God of the heavens being the creator of all things, who need, anybody who chooses not to accept Jesus and his gift of eternal life because they believe they're a good person and then they can do it on their own, all of this is making yourself God over them. And this is a problem because you can't, idolatry doesn't get you anywhere. That's what he's saying. These Gentiles who don't, who aren't Christians, and really he's kind of taking it to the new level now. It's Christians and Gentiles. He's using Gentiles because they never knew God at all. At least the Jews knew who God was. They haven't seen the Messiah. They haven't accepted the Messiah. Only Christians have accepted the Messiah because Jesus is the Messiah. The Jews don't believe in him. They're still waiting for their Messiah, which is foolish because the Bible very clearly points to Jesus as the only Messiah. And there will come a time when they look upon him and they will weep for the one that they pierced and realize that Jesus was their Christ and Messiah and Jesus will come back to rule and reign. That's the timeline now. But it's important you understand these things because knowing Jesus is the only decision you have to make right now. And it's imperative because we don't know when things are going to change for the worse. You don't know the day your life is going to end. And once your life ends, it's too late. And you cannot accept Jesus after that. Verse 19, they, 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 they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and they eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature like a cloak. Put it on like a garment. A new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Take off your sinful nature. Put on your holy and godly nature through the Holy Spirit. Verse 25, so stop telling lies. 
let us tell our neighbors the truth. Take off the old, the liar, and put on the new. Speak the truth. Remember that if you lie, you're a liar. If you stop telling lies, but you leave it at that, you'll always be a liar. But if you repent of your lying and start telling the truth, you've put on the new man, as it says in New King James Version. You've put on the new man. Here's another example. If you're a thief, uh, uh, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbor the truth, for we are all parts of the same body, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Here's another, here's another example. Don't be angry. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Are you an angry person? Do you have trouble controlling your anger? Take off the old man, seek, the, seek to repent of your anger, and put on the new righteous man and be gentle be gentle. Don't let anger go on, carry on to the next day. Go and get it fixed so that Satan doesn't have a foothold. This is important in marriage. Make sure the sun doesn't go down on an argument. Get it fixed so that you can stand back to back and fight outwards. The minute you're fighting inwards, the devil has a foothold to bring bitterness into your marriage. It's no place to be. Here's another example, verse 25, uh, 28. If you are a thief, Quit stealing. Now, if you just quit stealing, you're still a thief. But if you repent of your theft and put on the new man, what would you expect to do? Quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for a good hard work and give generously to others in need. So instead of taking, give. It's a perfect example of taking off the old man and putting on the new. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Take off your old self and all the crap that you talk about and put on your new self and encourage and love one another. A perfect example of, of throwing away. By the way, I used to cuss like a sailor. Boy, I took off that old man because the spirit led me not to speak that way anymore. And now it's really rare when I let one slip. And then I repent of that because I feel horrible. Who would have known that had you known me nine, ten years ago? <coughs> it's so amazing. Take off the old man and put on the new. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as, as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. That's beautiful. Take off the old. And put on the new. Be the complete opposite of what you've been. The Spirit will help you do that. And I promise you, you'll live a life that's far better. It feels far better. It feels cleaner. People will, will, people will act differently around you. They'll see you in a different light. So many people going through so much right now with no hope will say, "What? what is it? How is it that that guy lives through the horrible things that happen and yet he's always happy and always speaking encouragement into other people's lives? It's because it's the Christ. It's the spirit that rests upon us that lets us do that. Take off the old and put on the new. Well, I told you that in the midst of this letter that says, because God has blessed you with all of these things, take off the old man and put on the new, the new one is to live a life reverence, reverential to God, to be, to, to be a beacon of light for others because, and to live your life for God. Be, not because you have to, but because you want to. Because you want to show other people what God has done for you. My whole heart in all of this is to show people what I know about God. Because we can, we can get mad at the fact he doesn't tell us things about himself, or we can rejoice in the fact he tells us a lot about himself by the way that he works through us, through the word and through meditation, through prayer, and through how we love others. Well, I told you in Luke chapter 19, there's a study. Here's a, here's a, perfect, here's a perfect case study of this kind of thing. Jesus is, runs into a man named Zacchaeus. It says in 19 verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. 
There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> if you were a tax collector, you were a Jew that was fleecing the flock uh, for the Romans, and nobody liked you. You were the worst of the worst. So if you're a chief tax collector, which means you're kind of the, the head honcho, all the all the little tax collectors are, are sucking up the tax money, and the tax money then goes up to the chief tax collector, then you've moved yourself in a place that is completely decrepit to those who are the Jewish people around them. Nobody trusts you. Nobody likes you. Nobody wants that. That's evil and wicked because they were fleecing the flock. They were being, they were being untruthful so that they could gain on their wealth. Rome, Rome said, collect what we want. Anything over and above, you get to keep. So they were overtaxing so that they could get theirs. And that was not seen very well. So verse two says, there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. <clears throat> he tried to get a look at Jesus and he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree behind this road for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him down and he said, Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Now, put a pin in that. Jesus is telling Zacchaeus, I need to come and dine with you today at your house. Now, Zacchaeus has a choice. He is not liked by anyone. And he's he, Jesus, this guy, he either believes Jesus is, he is, he is who he is or he doesn't. Look how he reacts. Zacchaeus, he said, come down now. I must have be a guest at your home today. Verse six, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Wow. He took off the old and he put on the new. Now, these are just statements that he's making to Jesus. Whether he did it or not, I don't know. But do you see the picture? That all of this take, 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 take that's created all this drama in his life, a chief sinner, he took it off. He called Jesus into his house. He put on the new man and he said, you know, instead, I'm going to make it right and I'm going to give complete 180 from what he is. He's repented of his sins and he's going to change himself by putting on the new man. Look how Jesus reacts. Verse nine, Jesus responded, salvation has come to his home today for this man has shown himself to be true son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. That statement at the end there, well, all these people are grumbling that Jesus went into the house of a sinner, but Jesus went into the house of a sinner to save the sinner from himself. And we're all sinners. So, so we can't make this statement. They are, they're, these people are so angry because he's going in to have dinner with this guy that everybody reviles, but he came to save the lost. Zacchaeus and me. And I'm grateful that he, that he has saved me, that he has come in to dine with me, that he knocked on the door and I let him in. That I put off the old man and I, I took off the old man and I put on the new. My life changed in an instant. And has put me in this place where I can share these things with you. So Zacchaeus does exactly what Paul is talking to in the, in the book of Ephesians. Put off the old man. Put on the new. Well, here's a warning. In, in the book of Revelation, at the, at, in, in the, at the end of chapter 3, there's a letter to the church at Laodicea. And this is a church that decided they didn't need Christ because they could do it on their own. They were good people. They were doing good things and they didn't need Jesus. They didn't need God. They just knew that they were that they were rich, that they were well, let's this look at the words of Jesus. Verse 15 of chapter 3 of Revelation, I know all the things you do that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. And then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will be not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes. So you will be able to see. I correct the discipline everyone I love. 
So be diligent and turn from your indifference. He says, you guys, you think you've got everything you need, but you fail to understand the real thing that's important, that spiritually you're dead, that you're not hot or cold, you're lukewarm. I'll spit you out of my mouth. I won't accept you for that. You need to come to me and be ignited. And I will give you everything you need to understand who you are, what you have. I will give you true riches and I will give you true sight and I will give you true purity because you can't do it on your own. But here's the, here's the kicker. And this is a question he's asking everyone on earth right now. It says here, verse 20, look, I stand at the door and knock. He's not kicking the door in. He's not forcing his way in with the SWAT team. He's not coming in and bombing your house. He's gently knocking on your door. Just like Zacchaeus, who could say yes or no, he's giving you a choice. If you let him in, he will come and make, he will dine with you. He will have a dinner with you. It says here, it says here, open the, uh, look, I stand here and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. That is an intimacy that you cannot ask of, of any other God, of any other deity, in any other religion, anywhere, in any time. Jesus loves you and wants to have an intimate relationship with you. It is the most, it is the most intimate relationship of all time. And I can tell you this because, because I am no, I'm I'm not closer to anyone on earth and I am with him. And when we stand before him in heaven and he is with us forever, because he says, you'll be with me forever and I will never leave you again. That's the intimacy I want with my God, the creator of the universe, the person who saved my soul, but it's knocking. The door needs to be opened. You need to let him in. He will come in and have an intimate and had an intimate dining experience with you in that culture when you ate food, when I took a piece of bread and I broke it and I gave you half of it, it's like I'm eating part of you and you're eating part of me. It comes together in this relationship that's intimate. It's an intimate thing to share a meal with someone. And Jesus is telling you that if you let him in, he will give you an intimacy you've never had before. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with me on my father's throne. Anyone with the ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Do you have ears to hear what Jesus is saying? Do you have ears to hear that Jesus is calling you by name, calling you to himself, knocking on the door, waiting for you to invite him in? Then you can take off the old man and put on the new because the Holy Spirit is the only one who can help us do that because we're caught up in our own sinful natures and he's the one who can cleanse us from that. And then whenever this earth ends, whenever we're done here, whether by physical death, then the very next breath I take is in the presence of the Lord or by the rapture in which we're all called up together to Christ in heaven. Everything that's going on in this world today will be over and we will live in eternity and perfection forever. Everything that's going on right now is prophecy. God's in control. And it's to wake you up to this station, to this fact that Jesus is knocking on your door. Will you invite him in? Be blessed.